Sometimes the most beautiful natural phenomena can have devastating consequences. When the sun ejects hot charged particles into space, the aurora borealis is created here on Earth. An aurora is a natural light display in the sky, from the Latin word aurora, sunrise, or the Roman goddess of dawn, especially in high latitude regions caused by the collision of charged particles in the solar wind with magnetic fields high in the atmosphere. Hi. I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and today we have a real special honor. We have with us a, a renowned, best-selling author and an MIT grad, Matt Stein. Uh, Matt's here to talk about electromagnetic pulses, commonly called EMPs, and solar storms. So, Matt, I'd like to welcome you to Fairwinds, cool. and also I'd like to uh, ask the first question. What the heck is an EMP? Well, thanks for having me on. And an EMP is, is stands for electromagnetic pulse. So what happens in a pulse, an EMP, whether it's, a, whether it's a, a highly charged plasma coming from the sun in a coronal mass ejection, like the sun burps and a bunch of sun stuff goes launched into space at a thousand times faster than our rockets fly and go out through space. And then, uh, and then some, on, on rare occasions, they actually hit the planet Earth. And on even rarer occasions, like we've had about a hundred very significant geomagnetic storms in the last 152 years. But we've had two extreme geomagnetic storms in the last 152 years. And so the problem on our planet, just kind of starting to connect the EMP and solar storm, is that the last time we had a really big storm on our planet was in 1921, the great geomagnetic storm in 1921. 93 years ago was the last time we had a really big one. So since then, our grid has grown and our technology's grown and we have these Achilles heels in the grid now that didn't exist in 1921. But now we have this giant interconnected grid with these massive transformers that are super susceptible to the EMP. Well, on top of that, we have microelectronics. Now, a solar storm doesn't really affect the microelectronics because it doesn't have the E1 and E2 effect of the EMP. So the EMP is much more devastating to electronics on a, on a smaller level, uh, on the area, the affected level. But the solar storm is much more devastating in a different way in that it doesn't really mess up your small electronics. It won't cause immediate meltdowns of your nuclear power plants. What the, EM, what the solar storm will do is it will fry much of the grid over most of the northern and southern hemispheres for a long, long, long period of time. And the problem is that these giant transformers that I'm talking about that are susceptible both to EMP damage and solar storm damage, they're roughly 100 tons each. They're $10 million a piece, roughly. And they're custom built and custom designed. And right now there's a three year waiting list to have one. If you want, if, in other words, when one fries, and they do on rare occasions, they burn up eventually, it takes a year to get a replacement for it, or three years. It, when things are going well, or if it's a rush order, you can get one in a year. But normally, like if you just wanted to expand your grid, you got to think three years ahead. So in the event of an EMP, you're going to probably lose dozens of these transformers in a single EMP, perhaps even 50, 60, 70. In the event of a massive solar storm, which is guaranteed to happen, the last one was 1921. It was only 60 years before that to an even bigger storm, the 1859 Carrington event. So when this is a guaranteed event, I mean, talk about an end of the world scenario, end of the world as we know it, certainly. I mean, an EMP itself is bad enough. When you think about, we're going to have failed infrastructure, think about 100 Hurricane Katrinas happening at the same time. Think about how a response was to a single Hurricane Katrina. Now imagine 100 Hurricane Katrinas, the entire half of the United States, eastern half of the United States, the most densely populated part of the United States, it's like a Hurricane Katrina has hit that entire place. The infrastructure is destroyed. The grid is destroyed. The electronics are destroyed. Our manufacturing abilities are destroyed. Everything is down for a long, long time because there aren't en enough spare parts in the world to fix that stuff for years. You know, let me tell you a story. I was in um, Washington at the RIC, the Regulatory Information Conference yeah. in 2012. And I had a chance to ask a question of then NRC Chairman Yasko. And I asked him, not about a bomb EMP, but, but about the solar storm electromagnetic pulse. And what was the NRC doing about that? 
And he said it was the last thing on his agenda. <laughs> he just basically felt it was, compared but, to the other issues on his regulatory agenda, it wasn't something he was interested in. Well, I have a letter in my notes right here from Dr. William Graham. Now, Dr. William Graham, I keep wanting to call him Billy Graham, but that's a different doctor. Dr. William Graham was Ronald Reagan's chief science officer for several years, his chief science advisor to Ronald Reagan. He spent more than 30 years in the Department of Defense nuclear program. He's a PhD physicist. He was the chairman of the bipartisan EMP commission that was, that was appointed by Congress to study this problem. And he has a letter dated October that was received by the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It was addressed specifically to him in October of 2011, a few months after Fukushima had, had happened. And he is warning them of the specific issue of multiple Fukushima-like events in the event of either a terrorist artificial EMP or a solar storm and in along the lines of the 1921 geomagnetic storm. And you say, well, how, what's the chances of this happening? Well, scientifically, the, the chance of, a, of an extreme geomagnetic event, which is a grid collapsing event over most of North America, is one in eight every decade. So I don't know about you, but if somebody told me, oh, don't worry about boarding that plane, there's only a one in eight chance it's going to crash. You know, I'd be really, I would not get on that plane. But what we're being told is every single decade, we have a one in eight chance that the world as we know it is going to end, unless we fix it. And there is a solution, a partial solution, to protect the grid at least. And, and everything in our world depends on the grid. All these things I'm talking about, when the grid is down, nothing is working. And, and we can protect the grid for the price of a single B-2 bomber, a single stealth bomber. And so far, they're only talking about it. Now, for 50 years, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers warned that the levees around New Orleans were going to fail. Not if they were going to fail, but they were going to fail when the next Category 3 or stronger hurricane hit. They said it's not a question of if, but when. We don't know when that next storm is going to hit. So for 50 years, they said it's going to happen, it's going to be a catastrophe, and we can fix it. It just takes money. And for 50 years, they were ignored. In fact, at one point, they approved the money. And then the politicians shuffled it into something else because it wasn't sexy. You know, it's not like having a nice new amphitheater or, you know, a, a big sports arena or something like that to show. It's just fixing these levees. And, and everyone looks, well, they're not broken, right? Nothing's happened. Everything's okay. So we're in that situation right now where the scientists and engineers, the Department of Defense, Oak Ridge National Labs, Sandia National Labs, Los Alamos National Labs, these guys all agree this is a real and genuine problem. So what's the chance? One in eight chance every decade. It's been nine decades since the last one. It was six decades before that to the one before that. So we're living on borrowed time right now. No one knows. Right now we had a very quiet solar maximum. Nothing happened. But the truth of the matter is, max solar maximum, solar minimum, a killer solar storm can happen any time in the, in the solar cycle. It's just more prone to happen in the maximum. And so, yeah, we had a very quiet maximum, this last solar maximum. It doesn't mean it couldn't happen next week. In fact, earlier this year, there was a coronal mass ejection from the sun in a very quiet solar maximum that went off in a direction not too far from the Earth. If it had hit the Earth, it would have been at least as strong as the 1921 storm, and it would have been game over. And it went off, but it didn't hit us. It just missed us. And if it had hit us, it would have been game over. So, okay, we have a, the sun burps, sends these high, high energy particles, hits the Earth's atmosphere, and um, th that then hits the electric grid and causes a huge electric spike that burns out all of the... Not all, but many of them. Many of the, these huge transformers. Um, and that's a one, one in eight per decade, and we're nine decades into this. So it's going to happen. And we just don't know we're, we're living on borrowed time. The... Um, as I understand it, there was one of these that did knock out the transformer at a nuclear plant already. Yes, in 1989, they had a geomagnetic storm that was strong. But how strong is strong? It was one-tenth as strong as the 1921 storm. So the scientists who look at, look at different things and evaluate different storms geologically, the 1989 storm was one-tenth as strong. And it wiped out one of these massive transformers at a nuclear power plant in New Jersey. It wiped out one of these massive transformers at an, in the province of Quebec and one in the United Kingdom. 
So what was the result? Well, in Quebec, in the first 30 seconds, the first 30 seconds of this geomagnetic storm, there were 15 simultaneous failures in the grid, one of which being a massive transformer. The entire province of Quebec was blacked out and, um, for nine hours, six million people for nine hours. And there was some parts of Quebec were blacked out for two days. Well, that's one, one transformer. The Meditech study, which was funded by the Department of Defense and, and um, Oak Ridge National Labs oversaw it, and the National Science Foundation, these, these guys all pulled together, and they did computer modeling of the grid. And they based their analysis on the 1921 storm. The, the 1859 Carrington event was like the granddaddy of modern storms. That was 50% stronger. They anticipate that's in once every 500 year event, so they're not as worried about that. The 1921, they assume, is a once in every 75 to 100 years, somewhere in that range. You know, roughly, basically, we're due for that size one. So that event is 10 times stronger than the event that wiped out three transformers between Quebec and the United States and the UK, who lost three transformers. Now, in 2003, there was an event that was lower in intensity, but longer in duration than the 1989 event. And it wiped out a transformer in Sweden, and it wiped out, it caused 14 transformers eventually fail from the overheating and, and the loss of insulation in the coils. 14 transformers in South Africa failed. So, okay, so what does 14 transformers mean? For an entire year, the only way South Africa could function without 14 transformers was they had to ration power. So when you're going to work in South Africa in 2003, imagine going to work and for six or five or six hours, two or three times a week during your work day, there's no power. There's no lights, no air conditioning, no phones, no internet, nothing, no escalators, no elevators, nothing's working. And the entire country had to, sh had to switch power around the country for an entire year to keep the country functioning. And, and that was the only way they could do it. And that was for a baby storm. That was for a less than 10%, one-tenth, less than one-tenth of the strength. And you know as a scientist and engineer that if you, if you ramp up the strength of an event by a factor of 10, it's not like you have 10 times more failures. You have, because you, you, all of a sudden you start exceeding the threshold of far more things. When you, if you double it, then, then like you pass the threshold of damage on many more. You double it again and you weigh more. So I honestly think that, and I talked to John Kappenman who did the, was in, wrote the report for the Meditech study, and he admitted that they were very conservative in their estimates. They didn't want anybody jumping on them. And so when he said, like, oh, we're only going to collapse the grid to two-thirds of the country and stuff, that's really long-term collapse. Because, see, in, in the year 2003 also, they had these killer, they had a massive blackout on the eastern coast of the United States. And at first they said, oh, the terrorists, the terrorists, the terrorists did it. Well, it turned out there were some killer trees. You know, you got to watch out for those trees. They're very highly trained. Mm. You can never turn your back I on those trees. remember the killer trees. Yeah. Right. So you had a killer tree that caused a cascading failure from the Niagara plant, and it took out power to 50 million people in the United States. So there was no EMP, there was no terrorist act, there was just a killer tree that some power lines snagged into, sagged into, shorted out, and it caused a cascading failure. In 1996, we had killer trees in Oregon. We had a very hot day, the whole western coast is in a heat wave, uh, air conditioners going everywhere, the grid totally maxed out, and in the extreme heat, some power lines expanded and sagged and shorted in Oregon, cascading failure, entire west coast out of power, uh, some places as long as a couple days, most of the west coast for seven or eight hours. On that day, my brother and sister-in-law were driving through the Central Valley of California with their AC on, they ran out of gas. So they pulled into a gas station, it's like, oh, and everybody's sitting in the shade going like this at the gas station, and, and they're like, what the hell's going on? And I'm like, well, your money machine car's not working. The cash registers were locked closed. Um, no one could buy a drink. No one could buy a gallon of gas. And the pump that pumps the gas, of course, is isn't working. To, is right. working right? So nothing was working. And it was 110 out that day. You could fry an egg in the sun in the pavement, and they're stuck for five hours till the power came on. Now imagine if you're stuck for one day. To imagine this. Imagine you go out one night and you look up in the sky and you're in South Carolina 
and you see a scene you've never seen before in your life. The sky is blood red, orange, gold streaks, shimmering, and it's just awesome. And your view of the sky is so amazing because there's no city lights. And it's like, wow, this is really amazing. And there's no city lights that day, and you go to try and get on your computer, and there's no internet signal, and there's no phone signals, and you think, wow. And then the next day goes by, and it's still lit up like this. It, in 1921, the sky was lit up from the North Pole to Hawaii and Puerto Rico, and from the South Pole to American Samoa. So the only place the sky wasn't lit up at night in the whole planet was a very narrow, deep tropical zone right around the equator. And in 1921, that lasted for two nights and two days. And in 1859, there was two coronal mass ejections. So the first one hit the planet, got it spinning really, really hot, electromagnetically speaking. And then just as things are starting to cool down, a second coronal mass ejection, a one-two punch, came and hit the planet. And it got it electromagnetically charged up for another five days. So for a total of a week, the sky was just lit up. People were waking up at, at 2 in the morning in Colorado, back in the backcountry, and getting their gear ready, thinking it was daybreak, that it, you know, the sun no, was rising. I understand they could actually see that in Havana. In Havana. Yeah. Havana, that's right. So you're talking, and then start your, start your calendar going. And it's like, oh, nuclear power plants are required to have a week's worth of backup fuel on hand because the grid's never down for that long, right? It just doesn't happen. So here you've lost 370 transformers in the United States, a couple thousand in the world. That's 20 years of manufacturing capacity. When the world's working right, at today's current capacity, we could replace those transformers in only 20 years. But most of the world that makes those transformers is going to be down just like us and struggling in mass chaos. So you're talking 20 years at full capacity when the world's working well to make those transformers to replace what fried in a single storm. So you're talking, you know, you're talking a situation where things are down for a long time. So a week later, nuclear power stands start running out of backup fuel. Unless they manage to get the government and the military organized to guarantee fuel arriving to 104 nuclear power plants in the United States, you're going to start seeing Fukushima-like things happening. Maybe they'll keep fuel running to some, but all 104, are they, when there's chaos, when, when there's hijackings, when nothing's working, do you honestly think that trucks are going to just roll down the road with diesel fuel and, and provide all these power plants with fuel to keep them going? Now, some of these reactor plant guys called me up and said, well, the NRC says that we're mandated to have a week's worth of fuel on hand, but we have a month on hand. Okay, so you got a month. You think the world's going to be back together in a month? The EMP Commission estimates it's going to be six to nine months at the minimum and probably multiple years to get things back up and running in any decent shape, way, shape, or form. So you're talking chaos and the world as we know it being very different for a long period of time. And if they're not 100% successful at keeping these nuclear power plants going, and that's in the event of a solar storm. See, in the event of an EMP, it's a different worry. Because in, in the solar storm, the good news is that at least your control systems, digital control systems and things, are probably still working. If, if you can get backup generators going and keep them powered, then you can probably maintain some control. Because it's just fried, the grid is down, and, and the whole infrastructure will cascading failures over the next couple of weeks, everything will fall apart. But you know, the phones no, are still working. Them. So what, what, what that means is, so a solar storm electromagnetic pulse wipes out everything between the big wires and the transformers. But the nuclear plant on the other side of the transformer doesn't see the solar storm pulse it, in a solar EMP. It, it, uh, we don't know for sure because none of that stuff was around in 1921 when the last extreme event, solar event happened. But the scientists believe that your digital electronic stuff is mostly going to survive. They're not saying there won't be some pulses that are going to wipe out some digital stuff. But in general, that stuff is going to survive. What's going to fry is these massive transformers that interconnect our grid, that keep the grid flowing. So, and those have caused like big grid failures in South Africa. It caused you know power failures in the UK, power failures in Sweden, power failures in the United States and it caused the entire province of Quebec to black out short term. But the problem is that when you lose so many of these transformers, not one or two, but hundreds of transformers, 
then your interconnecting grid is going to collapse and pretty much shut down everywhere. And then they'll be able to disconnect pieces of the grid and restart areas if they have lots of local power generation and if they're not heavily densely populated and that they didn't and they survive without a lot of local damage from the solar storm then they'll be able to disconnect and restart certain areas but most of the heavily populated and industrialized parts of the country will have enough density in them in the modeling that those areas will suffer long-term collapse not just like oh everything went down for a few days and we were able to get them restarted in some places so they'll be able to restart pieces of the country but large zones of the country will have so much damage they won't be able to restart. So the NRC is relying on there being diesel deliveries and basically social mayhem to keep a, a, a nuclear plant running beyond the seventh day. Right. The NRC is relying on on positive thinking. <laughs> you know, we saw wishful that. thinking. They're we wishful that. thinking that every that that it's just not going to be that bad. Like well, that these guys are. These guys are gloom and doomers, and it's just not going to be that bad. The best emergency planners in the world are the Japanese. Yeah. I mean, they know that, that tsunamis happen. They know that earthquakes happen. And the emergency planning system in Japan failed miserably. During right. The, so Horribly. for us to rely on studies from the NRC telling me that, don't worry, we'll get the gas, we'll get the, the diesel fuel to these nuclear plants once a week for the next three or four years. Um, so there's no, we don't have any concerns here. Is, is really, really what okay. say. Now, that's a solar storm. That's a solar storm. Now, go that's back not in our control. Right. And it's a one in eight decade kind of an event. Right. It's a one in every eight decade kind of event. It's been nine decades since the last one. Got it. So, so we're, we're living on borrowed time. So, how do you live knowing all this stuff? <laughs> well, you know, people say, well, you seem like a cheerful guy. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like Mr. Gloom and Doom and yet you're smiling. You know, it's, I basically do what I can. I feel like I'm here to serve in whatever way I can, and I do my best. My motto that I like to end things on, and I'll just tell you right now because you're asking me that question, my motto is I ask everyone to do their best to change the world and do their best to be ready for the changes in the world. And so I'm doing my best to educate people and wake them up and I see that we have you know, multiple challenges, that we're collapsing our world. Business as we know it are killing the planet, are destroying the natural systems that maintain life as we know it on planet Earth and keep humans and mammals alive. And, so, and we also have this thing where we've created these systems that are highly susceptible, Achilles heels, to both EMPs and solar storms. And so it's kind of like rolling the dice. Like what we're doing is going to collapse the planet in, in the not very distant future if we keep it up the way we're doing it. And we have these Achilles heels. It could be an instantaneous collapse if we don't do the right thing. Now here's the silly part. For the price of a single B-2 bomber, they have invented these large vacuum tube devices and they've tested them at the same um, Curtis Brian Burtonbach, I think it's his name, or Burnbach. And they have this, uh, the biggest EMP testing facility in the world. They do a lot of testing for the DOD. And he's extremely worried about this, for good reason. He's very worried about both EMP and solar storms. So they have invented a large vacuum tube device that reacts fast enough and can handle such huge amounts of power that it can inst almost instantaneously shunt power around these transformers into Earth and protect them from both EMP and solar storms. So we can't protect all of our electronics from an EMP. Most of our electronics won't be affected by the solar storm if we can keep the grid up. So we, if we can at least keep the grid functioning, then we can keep pumps going, then we can, you know, we can at least keep part of our world going, at least with manual stuff, even though a lot of the digital stuff will be gone. So it'll be rough, but it's doable. So we could, for two billion bucks, we could protect all of these massive transformers in the grid, and the grid from, from meltdown in the event of a solar storm or an EMP. And for another billion bucks or so, we could put EMP hardened containers with backup critical electronics, backup generators, and store a year's worth of fuel at each of our 104 nuclear reactors. So yes, it would be chaos, it would be rough, even if we did the right thing, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. But if we do the wrong thing, then either an EMP or a solar storm could basically be the... An EMP would be the end of America as we know it. And a solar storm would be the end of the world as we know it.
but we could fix yeah. it. For you know, it reminds me of the uh, uh, the tsunami at Fukushima. The the tradition in Japan has seen tsunamis as high as a hundred feet, right? And certainly tsunamis as high as thirty feet. But in light of that, they built a tsunami wall that was only fifteen feet high. So we have the opportunity to build our tsunami wall against solar detectors because we know it's coming, right? And it's not going to break uh, break the bank. A couple billion dollars, this problem solved. It, it, it's chill. And here's the part of here's part of the other pair. You know, it just kills me is NERC, North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Sounds like the good guys. They're, it's a private corporation from industry insiders in the electric utilities, and they talk about you know, protecting the grid and grid reliability. And then FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, is the federal government governing board that, that kind of follows everything and, and regulates stuff. So what happens? Well, NERC is kind of worried about the grid, so they sponsor this conference, and and they look at threats to the grid, and whether it's from you know terrorists and and, and uh, digital threats, you know, killer trees, hacking, killer trees, you know, various things, and they determine in this that the EMPs and solar storms are the number one and two threats that could really be serious. They call black swan events. They happen now and then, not so often that you're really worried that you're paying much attention to them, but when they happen, they can be huge events. So they publish a report called the HILF Report, High Impact Low Frequency Report, and they talk about these dangers. Now after that, in the government, they put the SHIELD Act into Congress. And the SHIELD Act is saying that private industry is going to pony up $2 billion out of their bottom line, out of their pocket, and they're going to fix the grid. Well, NERC goes, wait a minute. That's a lot of money for private industry. That's a lot of money out of our bottom line. So what does NERC do? Well, they basically fire the guys that wrote the Hilf report and said how dangerous this was. And they come out with a new report that says everything's okay. Don't worry, we got it covered. And they go to conference. And this tell them Congress just what they want to hear. And they say, oh, well, this is terrific. This is so wonderful. Tell them, what, you know, what, what new modeling did you do? What, what new you know, scientific study and data did you take to, to do this? Oh, uh, we didn't do any new modeling. And they're like, well, well what about the Meditech Corporation study, that, the one that you know, the Sandian, that Oak Ridge National Labs, like, oversaw and sponsored, and, and the National Science Foundation and Department of Homeland Security, you know, what, what about that? And they said, well, there's proprietary computer code in the Meditech study, so we couldn't really evaluate it. But we talked to our members, and we decided we got it covered. Now, I tell you, when three, when three Transformers blew in the 1989 event, which was one-tenth as strong as the 1921 event, which was 50% weaker than the 1859 event. And yet, they're telling you they have it covered. So then, guess what they just did? In June, they published a standard. FERC, the Federal Regulatory Commission, came to NERC and said, could you please write us a safety standard and a protocol for solar storms? So they said, sure. So they wrote this standard, and they got it passed, and, they, and NERC rubber stamped it, and the standard tells people what to do in the event of a solar storm. And the standard says, then we, every utility has to spend an average of 20 hours training somebody every year to make sure we implement this standard correctly. Now, the standard doesn't mandate that they put any hardware in, no current detectors to tell them how big the storm is and how, the, how dangerous it is to the grid. So they have no idea to make a make or break decision. Like is somebody going to just go in and shut down power to the eastern United States? And like if they're wrong, I mean that's the end of their career for sure if they're wrong. And so, and yet, and how are they going to make that decision when they have no hardware implemented to tell them how serious the storm is? Plus, in 1989, in the first 30 seconds of the storm, 15 simultaneous hardware failures, including one of those massive transformers, in the first 30 seconds, what human being is going to go out and be able to make a decision in 30 seconds? of that scale, of a massive scale, and make the right decision. It's totally impossible. So we got these satellites that are watching the sun, and the satellite sees this huge solar flare that likely is going to hit the Earth, yeah. and may, but maybe it'll miss. Right. And the, um, so the scientists go to the president, and they say, well, maybe this thing's going to hit, maybe it's going to miss. Is it, do we need a presidential edict to shut the grid down anticipating Right. that this thing will happen. Right. Or if it misses, we'll all look like fools, so let's keep the grid going. 
Right. That seems to be the, the only solution we've got in place right now. That's correct. That's all we have now is you're totally dependent upon, because let's face it, no human being is going to make that decision on their own. And so, and so in terms of a solar storm, a fast-moving solar storm can hit the planet in 12 hours. And the average solar storm is two to three days. So fast storms are 12 hours, one day, day and a half, and slow storms can hit as late as five days. But figure in general, you're going to have about 24 to 48 hours notice at most. And, and then, and, you know, those are people watching the sun are going to have to make those decisions, get to the right people, make massive decisions. And, you know, ch chances that they're going to really protect everything are pretty slim. So now you've written a couple books about this topic. Can you let our listeners know what, the, what they might want to read? Sure. Well, this book is my more recent book called uh, When Disaster Strikes. And it's an emergency preparedness and survival manual. And people, people who uh, read these kinds of things think it's pretty much the best out there. And so, so this book has chapters specifically devoted to EMP and solar storm, survival chapters and prepping and strategies and what they are. This bigger book uh, is my first book, the second edition, uh, widely expanded in 2008 of When Technology Fails. In this book, the, the subtitle describes it very well. It's called The Manual for Self-Reliance, Sustainability, and Surviving the Long Emergency. And so this book is kind of half eco-green sustainability and half how do you plan for and deal with varying levels of things falling apart in the world. So in my mind, if things really fell apart, I would much rather fall back on 18th century technologies live like Thomas Jefferson days or Abraham Lincoln days, then go back to caveman days and eating worms and grubs and, you know, <laughs> foraging for everything and, and living that kind of existence. Yeah. It took me about a year to decide that maybe it was a good idea and maybe I could do it. Another year to read a whole bunch of books and write a proposal and find a publisher. And then a third year to work 70 hours a week, seven days a week. I only work six hours on Sunday. I've worked 12 hours, 12 hour days the rest of the week and six hours on Sunday and uh, did that for nine months to finish it off. So, and then I put another year into updating it in 2008 with, and it was like 50% bigger by word count. So these are my, uh, this is my itty bitty big book and, uh, and then the smaller book right here. All right, well thank you very much and I'm sure the, the people who listen to these videos want to appreciate it. And two, won't sleep very well tonight. Well, you know, again, I'll just stress my motto one more time, and that's do your best to change the world and do your best to be ready for the changes in the world. And thank you, Arnie. It's been a real pleasure being, being with you today. Glad you could come. What would happen if a nuclear weapon were exploded in space above the United States? In this video, author Matt Stein discusses the devastating impact on nuclear power plants should a rogue nation or terrorist detonate just one nuclear bomb in space. On a previous video, Matt discussed what would happen in the event of a solar storm. Those of you who watched that first video may notice brief scenes where previous information is repeated. Hi, I'm Ernie Gunderson from Fairwinds. And today we have a real special honor. We have with us a, a renowned best-selling author and an MIT grad, Matt Stein. Uh, Matt's here to talk about electromagnetic pulses, commonly called EMPs, and solar storms. So Matt, I'd like to welcome you to Fairwinds. Cool. And also I'd like to uh, ask the first question, what the heck is an EMP? Well, thanks for having me on. And an EMP is, is stands for electromagnetic pulse. And what happens is, when a nuclear device is blown off in the upper atmosphere, the gamma rays coming out of the device interact with the atmosphere and causes a super highly charged effect. And that makes an electromagnetic pulse that goes down onto the planet. And you actually have three effects. You have an E1 effect, an E2 effect, and an E3. And the combination of those effects both destroys a lot of your electronics within a line of sight area, as well as taking down, causing an effect, the slowest effect causes a, a grid collapse. So what you'll do is basically the world as you know it within the affected area of the EMP is going to cease to exist for a fairly significant period of time. All of the stuff, the infrastructure is going to collapse, everything we use to run our daily lives, our factories, our nuclear power plants, our pollution treatment plants, 
uh, you know, no phone systems, no internet, no refrigeration, no water treatment, no sewage pumps, and no oil refining. I mean, everything in our world within that EMP effect is going to shut down. Wow, that's frightening. Now, does that include my laptop? Well, here's the, there's some popular misconceptions about EMP. There's, there's a book called One Second After, and Newt Gingrich talked about it, and the conception is that everything electronic fails within the zone. And actual tests on EMP, where they simulate EMPs in Department of Defense labs, uh, they find that it's not exactly the case. So a lot of your small stuff, like your iPhones, most of them probably still work. Uh, your radio, transistor radios, small discrete electronics are still going to work. The problem is that everything that's digitally controlled that has significant wires attached to it is going to fail, essentially 100%. So what it means is like most of your cars driving down the road, there's a popular misconception that all cars will just immediately stop in an EMP. And it turns out about 15% of the cars will stop in EMP simulation tests. So that means one out of every seven or eight cars will just grind to a halt, driving down the road. Wherever they are, they're done. They're not going anywhere. And most of the cars sitting in your parking lot won't. The problem is that all of the stuff that makes our world go round, 100% failure. So basically, all the electronic stuff where there's a bunch of wires that connecting things called digital control systems, remote sensing control and data acquisition systems, uh, all of that stuff, 100% failure. So essentially, there's three effects to an EMP. There's an E1, an E2, and E3. So in the E1, what happens is it's a, it's a, it's a line of sight almost, almost instantaneous, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a blink of an eye. And it's an electrostatic effect. It's like rubbing your, rubbing your feet on the carpet in a cold winter's day, opening up your digital electronics, and sparking a bunch of the chips with, with the static sparks. And, and then wondering, gee, I wonder what's going to happen to that. So that's the E1 effect. So a lot of the digital microelectronics is very, very susceptible to E1. Then between a half second and two seconds, you have an E2 effect. And that's as if there's 50,000 lightning bolts hitting the ground in every few square miles over the, over the affected area. And unfortunately, those surge protectors that we have to protect our computers and stuff, most of them will have been disabled and destroyed by the E1 effect. So the things that we designed to protect our electronics, most of that's failed. So now the E2 effect is going to have these surges like lightning strikes happening all over, coming down the lines. Most of your stuff's going to be unprotected. It's just going to zap right into it. Then you have the E3 effect. The E3 effect happens from a couple of seconds to 15 minutes. The effect, E3 effect is like a long, slow burn. And it's the same thing, same effect essentially as an extreme geomagnetic storm, a solar storm from the sun, and the E3 effect are essentially the same. And what this does is imagine now you have the grid across the United States. Right now in modern day America, in modern day Western world, you have these massive transformers called extra high voltage transformers. And what they do is they'll step the voltage up in one area to between 350,000 and a million volts and then they'll send this super high voltage across these really big power lines way up in the air, down, you know, many, many miles away. And at the other end, they'll step it back down so it's usable in the local grid. And what happens is with the E3 effect, you get this huge electromagnetic pulse that's coming through. And it'll travel down these lines. And it hits the transformers at both ends. And then what it does to the transformers is it causes eddy currents in them. And it causes them, it disrupts. See, normally all of our stuff is going in phase like this, like 160 cycle power in phase. Now you have this burst of energy totally out of phase. It messes up the efficiency of the transformers. And now you've got like mil megawatts of power going through these transformers. They lose efficiency and they burn up. Because when they're inefficient, that extra efficiency loss is heat. It's waste energy. And so these burn up. So what happens then is within the affected area, and then you could say, well, how big is the affected area? Like, what are we talking about? Well, there's kind of three different scenarios with an EMP, and then there's a solar storm, which is some called natural EMP, and it's a little different. They're related, but a little different. And then on the black market, if you've got about 10 million bucks or so, you can buy a Scud missile on the black market. And a Scud missile can't deliver a large full-scale nuke, but it can deliver a small tactical nuke. So this is one scenario, is they get a Scud missile as tactical nuke, 
They put in a junk freighter across the east coast of the United States. They launch it up. It blows up 25 miles or so above the, above the surface of, of the eastern United States. And then you draw a 500-mile circle. So the small nuclear weapon, 500-mile circle. So that'll enclose like Boston, New York, Washington, D.C. Instantly, the infrastructure's collapsed. It's gone. It's just all the stuff that makes the Internet run, that makes our power plants, our nuclear plants, all that stuff is instantly fried. Anything that requires significant digital electronics that are interconnected with runs of, of wire, that wire is going to act like a big antenna. It's going to catch the electromagnetic pulse. It's going to funnel it into the digital electronics, and they're going to cook. So maybe your car is still running. Maybe your iPhone is still working. Maybe your transistor radio is still working. The TV stations are gone. The Internet is gone. Uh, the cell your towers pumps, the, the cell towers will, if they're not fried immediately, they're going to run out of backup power in three hours. The cell towers are almost certainly gone. And there's no sewage pumps running. So pretty soon you're going to see raw sewage coming up on Park Avenue and Broadway. You know, in the middle of Washington, D.C., there's manholes are going to have raw sewage start flowing out of the manholes. You go to flush your toilet and it flushes once and there's no water power, there's no water, there's no air conditioning, there's no nothing. There's no radios, there's no TV, there's no communication. So maybe your phone is good, but there's no signal from anywhere to come to your phone. So you can listen to music until the batteries die. And then if you don't have a way of charging batteries from the sun, then, then your phone is dead too. But basically all you can do is listen to music. You're not going to get a signal from anywhere. So how long is this going to last? Well, the good news about an EMP is that it's just within the affected area. The bad news about an EMP is that the destruction in, within the affected area is so huge that it's going to wipe out. There's, there's not going to be enough parts in the world to supply the stuff to replace and fix the things in that area. And the other bad news is that the way everything is fixed and diagnosed these days is on the Internet and using computers. And the Internet will be down, the grid will be down, everything that's transmitting information around will be down, and the people who know how to fix things manually the old-fashioned way are few and far between. Most of those guys are dead or retired now. So you're talking a long time to bring them up. Now here's the really bad news. The really bad news is that all of the stuff that controls our nuclear power plants will be fried like that. All of the stuff that the eyes and ears, the remote sensing control and data acquisition systems, they get information from the power plants and then feed information back inside to control it. It's all gone. Permanently. I mean, it's destroyed. And you can't just go out and fix it. It's like all gone. Like there's nothing left of that. So now, fast forward to an EMP. We have, in the old days, they had backup generators in the 19, early 1960s when the Soviets and the Americans did their EMP testing where before the above ground test ban treaty, uh, both America and Johnston Islands blew off a nuclear device like 50 miles above the planet of the Earth, or 20 miles above the planet of the Earth, and, sim and had an EMP test with an actual nuclear device. And similarly, the Soviets did the same thing in Kazakhstan, where they blew off a nuclear device you know, in the upper atmosphere and had an EMP test. So back then, in, in, in now in Johnston Island, the nuclear, the nuclear physicist who was a Nobel laureate, Nobel Prize winning physicist, did the calculations, but they didn't really understand it that well. So he missed his calculations by a factor of 10 to 1, because they, they didn't really understand it. So, I mean, it, it's not like they'd ever studied one before. It's their first time studying a real nuclear bomb, and it's the only time we've really been able to study a real nuclear bomb is, is right then, because then we had the above ground test ban treaty. And so what happened is, is all the instruments were calibrated for what he predicted the, the pulse was going to be, and they all decked. It's, it's like going 200 miles down the road on a car that has a speedometer that only goes to 20 miles per hour. You have no idea how big the pulse was because the speedometer is at the top. You, know, you have no idea how fast you're going. So what happened there at Johnston Island was 900 miles away in Honolulu, a bunch of streetlights went out and 50 or so cars wouldn't, wouldn't work, and a telephone switching station in Kauai was fried by the nuclear pulse, by the EMP. Well, you say, well, that's not too bad. But, of course, this is like 900 miles away. You know, this is a long ways away. Like an EMP from a, from a terrorist? 
We don't really know if that will ever happen. We hope it never will. Chances, the military guys are pretty sure somebody's going to get one through one of these days. And then you're talking a devastating effect over a, 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 anywhere between a pretty bad area to a really horrendous area. So like the next level up of an EMP is if somebody, like, one of the large scale nuclear devices, whether it was you know, from the Soviet Union or China or Pakistan or Israel, you know, one of those countries, or France or Germany, you know, one of those countries that has full scale nukes and launched it off on a real size missile, not just a Scud missile, but a big missile, then you're talking a 1500 mile circle. So now, how big is 1500 miles? Well, take a map, and you've got a graphic I'm, I'll provide you with this. Draw a circle that goes through Quebec City, Canada, goes around beyond Ottawa, beyond Chicago, and all the way down through Texas and over through Miami Beach. So then you've got a circle that includes about at least 80% of the 104 nuclear reactors in the United States are within this circle. And about 75% of the population of the United States is within this circle. So now imagine Maybe then, maybe all those reactors fail. Maybe only, maybe only half of those ones in the circles fail. So you've only got 40 nuclear reactors going Fukushima style at the same time in the United States for a large scale EMP. I mean, talk about an end of the world scenario. End of the world as we know it, certainly. I mean, an EMP itself is bad enough. When you think about we're going to have failed infrastructure. Think about 100 Hurricane Katrinas happening at the same time. Think about how a response was to a single Hurricane Katrina. Now imagine 100 Hurricane Katrinas. The entire half of the United States, eastern half of the United States, the most densely populated part of the United States. It's like a Hurricane Katrina has hit that entire place. The infrastructure is destroyed. The grid is destroyed. The electronics are destroyed. Our manufacturing abilities are destroyed. Everything is down for a long, long time because there aren't en enough spare parts in the world to fix that stuff. So the other one now is uh, right. anybody who has both a missile and a nuclear weapon. Right. And if, if you can either buy or program, black market, any of those things, that's correct. Yeah, that's a different scenario. That's a different game because in that one, let's compare like what happened in, in the Soviet CMP. Simulation. So roughly the same time we did Starfish Prime, which was the military code name for our EMP tests at Johnston Island, the Soviets did one in Kazakhstan. And so when they did one in Kazakhstan, they put a bunch of diesel generators on site because they knew that they anticipated it would take the grid down. So they had a bunch of very robust pre-microelectronics, which is the stuff that everyone who's worried about EMP says, that's the stuff you have to have. That's the old stuff. It's pre-microelectronics. See that on a on a chip, the traces are so close to each other that it's very easy to induce currents and cause them to jump traces and burn things out in chips. And you don't have to burn the whole chip out; you just have to burn a couple couple spots in the chip, and it doesn't work anymore. And so everyone says, "Get the pre, get the old stuff. That's going to be okay." Well, the Soviet Union came and they blew off their EMP. You know, they did a, a nuclear test where so many miles above the surface of the Earth, they blew off a large-scale nuclear device, like a one megaton device, not a little kiloton device like Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but like a megaton device. And the pulse came down, and it fried almost all of those robust backup generators. The stuff that everyone is worried about EMP says, get the old stuff that's good. It fried almost all of them. There was a power plant a thousand kilometers away from the town that was at ground zero. That's 600 EMP, miles. 600 yep. miles. There was a power line that was buried two meters, six feet under the ground. That's a 600 mile line buried two meters under the ground. And see, conventional thinking says that you're safe with anything that's buried and grounded. You're safe. Not so with EMPs. And so it induced so much current in that power line, six feet under the ground, that it burned the power plant down 600 miles away. And so not only did you know, the power coming from out of the area, the power plant that was 600 miles away burned down, and the backup generators burned down, and the grid and everything was fried and down in the, in the zone of the EMP. So the chances, that, the chances are about 100% that within the affected area, that most of the vast majority of the nuclear power plants will instantaneously lose all of their digital control. They'll go the, the grid will collapse and they'll go into emergency shutdown mode. But 
since they're not EMP hardened backup generators, they're almost certainly going to all fail. And so that means that instantane that means within 15 minutes after this EMP, most of the nuclear power plants within the affected zone are going to melt down Fukushima style. Most of them will, if not all. And it doesn't just have to be the diesel. I mean, we have all these microchips in the control room and on the switch gear that turns the pumps on and all, all that, stuff. that stuff. So it's not just running out of power. It's essentially, um, the, if, a, if a weapon is exploded in, play, in space by somebody who's not our friend, right. um, it can destroy the electronics in a nuclear plant. And it definitely... It will destroy the electronics. It, they, they, they found that in all complex digital control systems that run our factories, our nuclear power plants, our water treatment plants, all of that infrastructure is essentially 100% failure. You know, the small scale electronic things, your little test gear, your little stuff like that, many of those will survive. Not all, but many of them will survive. But all of the complex control systems that are wired with Ethernet cable and, and network together, 100% failure in EMP simulation. So, how do you live knowing all this stuff? <laughs> well, you know, people say, well, you seem like a cheerful guy. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like Mr. Gloom and Doom and yet you're smiling. You know, it's, I basically do what I can. I feel like I'm here to serve in whatever way I can. And I do my best. My motto that I like to end things on, and I'll just tell you right now because you're asking me that question. My motto is, I ask everyone to do their best to change the world and do their best to be ready for the changes in the world. And so I'm doing my best to educate people and wake them up. And I see that we have you know, multiple challenges, that we're collapsing our world. Business as we know it are killing the planet, are destroying the natural systems that maintain life as we know it on planet Earth and keep humans and mammals alive. And so, and we also have this thing where we've created these systems that are highly susceptible Achilles heels to both EMPs and solar storms and so it's kind of like rolling the dice like what we're doing is going to collapse the planet in in the not very distant future if we keep it up the way we're doing it and we have these Achilles heels it could be an instantaneous collapse if we don't do the right thing now here's the silly part for the price of a single B2 bomber they have invented these large vacuum tube devices and they tested them at the same um, Curtis Brian Burtonbach, I think it's his name, or Burnbach. And they have this, uh, the biggest EMP testing facility in the world. They do a lot of testing for the DOD. And he's extremely worried about this, for good reason. He's very worried about both EMP and solar storms. So they have invented a large vacuum tube device that reacts fast enough and can handle such huge amounts of power that it can inst almost instantaneously shunt power around these transformers into Earth and protect them from both EMP and solar storms. So we can't protect all of our electronics from an EMP. Most of our electronics won't be affected by the solar storm if we can keep the grid up. So we, if we can at least keep the grid functioning, then we can keep pumps going, then we can, you know, we can at least keep part of our world going, at least with manual stuff, even though a lot of the digital stuff will be gone. So it'll be rough, but it's doable. So we could, for two billion bucks, we could protect all of these massive transformers in the grid, and the grid from, from meltdown in the event of a solar storm or an EMP. And for another billion bucks or so, we could put EMP hardened containers with backup critical electronics, backup generators, and store years worth of fuel at each of our 104 nuclear reactors. So yes, it would be chaos, it would be rough, even if we did the right thing, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. But if we do the wrong thing, then either an EMP or a solar storm could basically be the... An EMP would be the end of America as we know it. And a solar storm would be the end of the world as we know it. But we could fix it. But in terms of an EMP, there's no warning. In terms of an EMP, you're talking which about... Which is a weapon in space. Yeah, which is talking about a missile coming in. You're talking about, you know, 10-minute warning. If it's launched off a freighter on the East Coast or a submarine, you're talking like... Two minute warning, you know, you're, you're talking, and that means two minutes before somebody in the military, some operator in the military is seated on a radar screen and says it's going. So like, if you've launched an ICBM from another continent, you're talking a 30 minute warning. 
if you're talking like the East Coast of the United States launching a missile, you're talking like a you know, 60 second warning, 30 second warning, five minute warning, de depending on how far away it's going and how far it's traveling. So the warning time is extremely short. But like I said, in the event of waiting for a storm to hit and deciding if it's strong enough, first 30 seconds, 15 sure. simultaneous failures. You know. yeah, yeah. So now you've written a couple books about this topic. Can you let our listeners know what, the, what they might want to read? Sure. Well, this book is my more recent book called uh, When Disaster Strikes. And it's an emergency preparedness and survival manual. And people, people who uh, read these kinds of things think it's pretty much the best out there. And so, so this book has chapters specifically devoted to EMP and solar storm, survival chapters and prepping and strategies and what they are. This bigger book uh, is my first book, the second edition, uh, widely expanded in 2008, of When Technology Fails. In this book, the, the subtitle describes it very well. It's called The Manual for Self-Reliance, Sustainability, and Surviving the Long Emergency. And so this book is kind of half eco-green sustainability and half how do you plan for and deal with varying levels of things falling apart in the world. So in my mind, if things really fell apart, I would much rather fall back on 18th century technologies, live like Thomas Jefferson days or Abraham Lincoln days, than go back to caveman days and eating worms and grubs and, you know, foraging for everything and, and living that kind of existence. So these are my, uh, this is my itty bitty big book and, uh, and then the smaller book right here. All right, well thank you very much and I'm sure the, the people who listen to these videos won't appreciate it and two, won't sleep very well tonight. Well, you know, again, I'll just stress my motto one more time and that's do your best to change the world and do your best to be ready for the changes in the world. And, Thank you, Arnie. It's been a real pleasure being being with you today. Glad you could come.